Thanks, Rich. Hey, did you take it off the counter so I don't have to grab it? Keep hers in place. It's okay, last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say, the word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty. Be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. I'm finding myself in the midst of you. Good morning and welcome to Washington Baptist Church. I'm glad that you could be here today. Uh, we've got a communion service. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, other things going on today. Jim and Cindy are away uh, traveling this week, so keep them in your prayers as well. Um, 
and uh, uh, just wanted to bring your attention to a couple of things in your bulletin this week. Uh, we do have uh, the ladies' uh, small group Bible study. Uh, just note the address uh, there at Patricia's house. Uh, she had requested to uh, host it this time graciously, and uh, so the ladies will be heading there at 1030 on Thursday. Um, and also notice as well, next Sunday is a Harmony Dinner and a uh, quarterly business meeting. It's usually the end of January, but there are a couple of mechanical things we're trying to get out of the way administratively, so uh, we move that to uh, February 11th here so we could get everything in that we need to. Uh, that will not be a long meeting, so don't let that keep you away or anything. Uh, that, that fellowship or harmony dinner will be more about the dinner than it will be about the church business. Uh, but we'd love to have you there uh, and be a part of that as well. So that's next week. Just bring something in uh, to share, a main dish, and uh, either a salad or a dessert with you. And uh, we'll provide the beverages for that. Um, the other thing I just wanted you to take note of um, is this little tear-off wing on your bulletin. Everybody has one. Um, on the back of that, of course, you can put prayer requests there. You can email them or text them if you want as well. On the back of, or on uh, the part that says uh, WP Church Connect, uh, want to get involved, uh, that gives you a list of things, uh, different ministries in the church that you might have some interest in, uh, as well as the discipleship or quest process. Uh, so this is really easy. If you are interested in any of those things and you want to be involved in them or be discipled, uh, you can check that box, put your name and contact information, uh, fold that up and uh, put it in the offering plate when the guys come along uh, to take the offering and uh, we'll make sure that, or they'll make sure that that gets into my hands and uh, we will go from there. Uh, we are excited a little bit later on. We got a presentation uh, for uh, two guys who made it uh, through the second book as well. Uh, so we're excited about that um, and another one that is almost finished with the first book. So we're working through that as well. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Uh, we can do more than one-on-one. -on -one. We can do one-on-two, one-on-three. And uh, some of the guys that we are working with now can also take other people through book number one. So uh, we're, we're getting there. Uh, but if you've, uh, if you've been wanting to start something, you let us know, and uh, we'll work that in there. So I just wanted to let you know about that as well, just a simple way when you're thinking about it, to request something or to be involved in something. If you don't know how to do that, and that's one way you can do it. You, of course, you can send emails or texts as well, and uh, we'll make sure that you get plugged into different areas. Um, this book here, which is book number three, is all about how we get involved in the church, how you can know your spiritual gifts, where they fit within the church, and what you can do about it. So that's book number three, um, and some of the guys are already into book number three. And uh, so that would help you to do that as well. So let's start this morning with a word of prayer, and we'll turn it over to the worship team. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege you've given us to be here, to look into your word, to consider your truth. Lord, we truly don't want to be the center of what we're doing here today. Not the speakers, not the musicians. Uh, Lord, together, um, we want to join in unity of giving praise to you and honor to your name. That, Lord, what we do here would be true worship. And that, Lord, we would give back to you the glory that is due you. We thank you, Lord, for this time that you give us each week to gather together so that you might, through the mutual encouragement of the body of Christ, bring us more back to the center of where you want us to be. Lord, all week long, the world pulls at us. Stresses and worries pull at us. Life pulls at us. Just responsibilities in general pull at us. Thank you for giving us these moments like... Uh, like worship services and Bible studies and fellowship times where, Lord, you can use others in the church and the body of Christ to bring us back to center. Lord, I pray that you would do just that today as we surrender our hearts and lives in true worship to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Uh, Pastor mentioned his prayer as well, too. Please join us in our worship this morning. <laughs> We come to bear the witness, the witness of the light that all believe in Him. Through Him who is the Christ, He is the true light. Gives light to every man. He comes into the world. He's coming back again.
the voice is crying out out of the wilderness prepare the way of the lord prepare the way for him let heaven open up and glory fill the sky this is the son of god we sing and testify Strength, my shield. 
Dear Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy to be able to worship you openly, to proclaim your word to others. And we pray that as we go forth from here, that you will give us the boldness and the faith that we need to speak with others and share with them. We pray for those who could not be here today. Uh, for those who are sick, who uh, we ask for, uh, for healing and comfort for them. For those who may be traveling, we ask for safety and that you will bring them back to us. We just pray that as we look into your word this morning, you will speak to us. We will learn more of you and as we go forth, we will be more like Christ. We pray that uh, our worship will be pleasing to you and our lives will be pleasing to you and glorifying to you as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
ask if you would stand with us as we continue our worship this morning here. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Oh, I want. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will.
there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me to your love to know the For this reason, we also, since the day we heard about it, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And together, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And to that we can all say, Amen. You can be seated, please. Oh, and a couple of the guys come up that have been working through the quest process with us. Uh, Joe has been working with Sean and Mike over a period of time. Is my mic on? Okay, we'll see if it stays on. I got it on now. So I did that last week and it kept dying, so I'm not sure what was going on there. Anyways, uh, we've been working through the quest process. Uh, both of them had finished book number one, so they're done. Uh, we have one more that's almost done with that book. Uh, then uh, they finished uh, the share book, and that's more focused on how to share your faith with others. Uh, so they've been working through that uh, together with Joe, as well as asking him questions that are off the book uh, and taking him down various rabbit trails. These Bible studies don't follow the book precisely. Uh, there's a lot of interaction, and uh, the guys have worked hard for that. So we just want to congratulate them uh, with these certificates. So congratulations, Sean, on completing that. Mike, congratulations. Thank you, guys. Could someone get their phone and come up and get a picture of Joe and the guys together? I want to send it to the church that helped us develop that. Just a close-up of the guys. Get your phone and then, yeah, there you go. Get a close-up picture of those guys. You guys, go over by the sign a little bit more. We'll get that quest process in there. Get that in there. Do one sideways like that and then one um, portrait. And then email them to me because so, texting reduces the, the resolution. There we go. All right. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something we had – Five baptisms a couple of weeks ago. We have people uh, getting certificates, and guess what? They're not even members. Huh? We have to do something about that. We do. We got to do something about that. But guess what? The eight o'clock prayer is working ever since we started that. Well, are we in the last days? I asked Pastor that question while going to the men's breakfast. He gave me 2 Timothy 3. Men will be lovers of self, money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, ungrateful, unholy, without self-control, and haters of good. An upside-down world, but that's the way, that is the way of the last days. Romans 1, invisible attributes, his invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature are clearly seen. Professing to be wise, they became as fools. God gave them over to their passions. They burned in their desire, woman with woman and men with men. They knew God's ordinance, 
they did the same and gave hearty approval to those who practiced them. Our society has blurred the line of righteousness and infused the meaning of tolerance and compassion, distorting the meaning of compassion to make ungodly things of the world seem true. I learned this, I learned this last week that out of all the illegal aliens flooding across the border, committing crimes, smuggling drugs, conducting organized crime, making forgery centers for illegal documents, and beating our police officers in the streets. Jimmy, please. After laughing and flipping us off, the Catholic charities gave, gave them money to escape prosecution. The sign of the times. Now, out of all the illegal aliens, there has become a protected class among them. You would think that it may be genuine people in need, but no. Jimmy. The protected class is the LBGTQ illegal alien. Can you imagine this, especially after reading Romans 1? The LGBTQ plus illegal will get significantly better housing, extra money, perks that all other illegals will not get. To add insult to injury, if they go to California, Gav Gavin Newsom's government will give them hormones and free sex change operations, all on the taxpayer's dime. Can you see the sign of the times as outlined in Romans 1? They knew God's ordinance. They did the same and gave hearty approval to those who protected them. Last week, I, discuss I, I discussed a mental picture I had during the baptism, a firestorm is chasing the unsaved, winds blowing, the flames twisting, people running, clothes singed and torn, only one step ahead of the flames. During my ride with Pastor, we discussed the urgency of saving someone falling from a cliff or stopping a blind person from crossing against the light, pulling somebody from a burning car. Yet, we don't have the urgency to save a person whose fate is worse than death, eternal damnation. He shared with me a Charles Spurgeon quote, if a sinner is damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead body. If they perish with our arms wrapped around about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exultations and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Picture this. Oh, we are in the days, we are in the end days. We have an example we can examine for guidance, the days of Noah. Picture men building a ship completely landlocked, sunny days and not doubting. Everyone else eating and drinking, mocking Noah. Noah preached repentance with no response other than mockery. Still, the days are sunny. The animals start to appear, two by two, giraffes, elephants, and lions. The people see these exotic animals. It is the sign of the times, but there's no urgency. Jesus gave us signs. Gender identity, 12-year-old children being chemically castrated, amongst the other signs. Yet... There is no urgency in the Christian community. The firestorm is chasing our friends and family. The strangers in the car is the stranger in the car is burning. Yet, as at the time of Noah, there's no urgency. In the last days of Noah, it's getting close to the end, and it is still sunny. And the animals are showing up two by two. They, like us, see the signs, like us, are eating and drinking. The ark is almost full, and yet, it's still sunny. Nearing the end of the loading of the ark, it starts to get cloudy, minutes left to live. What do you need to do? You need to fight like the third monkey on the ramp, and it's starting to rain. Now, that's urgency. Spread the gospel and help save your neighbor.
Thank you, Joe. Take your Bibles and open up to the Gospel of John, if you want. That's where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time. You can also turn in the beginning here to the book of Daniel, which I'm going to refer to uh, in the beginning. We are on our way. Now that we have talked about salvation, we've talked about baptism, we've talked about giving testimony of Jesus Christ and our, putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We relate to the communion table. Every six weeks we have communion. Um, nothing magical in six weeks. That's just what we chose to do instead of monthly, um, just so it doesn't become rote in our practices. But uh, it ends up being a little bit more special, I think, that way. Um, we've done all of those things. As a believer, now that we've joined the church, now that we're a part of the church, where do we go from here? What's the next step? What do we do? The Gospel of John is all about that. Believing in the Gospel of Jesus is not simply just a concept that I intellectually assent to. Yes, I believe that Jesus was. Yes, I believe that Jesus lived. I believe that he died. I believe that he rose from the dead. It's not just a concept that I accept. It's something that causes me to act and do something because of it. Believing and faith are never presented as concepts in Scripture. They are always presented as that which must include an action. So we're talking about the book of the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John, we've labeled this true equity, right? True equity from the greatest love. This is the witness of John not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John. This book is written late in the first century, probably in the mid-80s, maybe even close to 90, a little bit before 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, or at the same time, and shortly before the book of Revelation. God, the Gospel of John is written likely after most, if not all, the other apostles are gone. They're off the scene. John has been... Has been um, deported to the island of Patmos. He's on the island of Patmos now writing the Church of Jesus Christ. And there is this one last time to represent, like the earlier Gospels did, a part of who Jesus Christ was, but then take it one step further so that he ensures that he leaves behind for the church the answer to a two-word question. So what? We all know that he was here. We all witnessed or talked to those who were witnessing. At that point, even though the other apostles were gone, the people that were there at least were taught by the apostles. So they had first-hand word from the first-hand witnesses. John, now is the last of them, wanted to give a witness of who Jesus Christ was. Of course, the Gospel of Matthew was, was emphasizing all through the book of Matthew that he was king. He was the promised king, Messiah. Matthew is very kingdom-oriented. We have the Gospel of Mark. Mark wanted to present Jesus Christ as a servant. He came to serve. He washed the feet of the disciples. He fed them. He served them. He healed people. He cast out demons. So his emphasis was on Jesus Christ, the servant. Then we come to the Gospel of Luke. Luke Dr. Luke wrote that in the book of Acts to demonstrate especially that Jesus Christ was indeed the man promised in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, the Son of Man. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Those are the first three Gospels. Some call them uh, the Synoptic Gospels. They are the first three Gospels. The Gospel of John, like them, and contains some of the same materials as the other Gospels, but has a completely different focus. The Gospel of John comes in, and the emphasis is on his deity. You have the King Messiah, you have the servant, you have the man, you have God. That's the flow of the Gospels, and it was put together in our canon the way it was, in that order, on purpose. Well, who was this man? The whole purpose of John the Apostle in writing the Gospel of John was to communicate to the church, first and foremost, to reveal to them who he was. Secondly, the Messiah. Secondly, to reveal to them that he was the Savior. 
And thirdly, to communicate to them or to reveal to them his redemption through Jesus Christ. Messiah, Savior, redemption. In fact, that's the outline, and we'll give it to you later, of the entire book or the Gospel of John itself. So I want to talk to you about the revealing of the Messiah first out of Daniel chapter 3. How do we know, right, in the beginning was the Word, John 1.1, 1, 1, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So now we have the Word. All of our texts that we hold before us, whatever the translation is that you have, capitalizes the word Word. W, right? It's a capital letter. Why? Because they believe that that is a name of God, or the name of Jesus Christ specifically. How do we get there? So let me take you back to the book of Daniel as we start. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Now Daniel is, is, um, has been deported to Babylon, right? Um, at this time uh, in Babylon, we have uh, the beginning of Buddhism starting, right? Now Buddhism is, going, is, is beginning to come. It's about the 6th century B.C., and Siddhartha is beginning to make his travels and spread his teachings about a new enlightenment that's coming. At the same time, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going through that whole scenario in Babylon, okay, um, while, this was, while the other was going on in India. So now we come to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. Daniel chapter 3, where's 3? I, I put so many markings in my Bible that sometimes my eye doesn't catch the chapter mark. There it is. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Daniel chapter 3, right? The golden image. So King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He doesn't know what the dream is. His wise men can't interpret it. So uh, uh, eventually Daniel is called upon to interpret the dream. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, um, we can even start with verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste, and he said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast in, and bound in the midst of the fire? So these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow to the obelisk that Nebuchadnezzar raised and commanded the entire world to, to bow down and worship every time the sound of the trumpet came. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at that point were not willing to bow down. Um, and so he threw him into the fiery furnace. He looks into the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar does, after he has the guys thrown into the fiery furnace, and the people, the furnace, he had been, he'd made it so many times hotter that the people who threw him in, the guards that threw the three guys into the top of the furnace, uh, it was so hot that they died following the king's orders. The king's sitting at the bottom where the open the hearth is, and he's looking into the furnace, and he sees in there not three men that were cast in there, but now four, right? Verse 24, he said, Nebuchadnezzar says, the king was astounded. Was it not three men we cast bound um, in the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Now, your, your translation may say son of God. The best translation is son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't saying the God, the only God. He was saying there is one in there that is godlike. He is a descendant of the gods, something more than a man. And he didn't attribute that, that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was something different about that particular person. Let's turn over to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Now in Daniel chapter 6, he's serving Darius. Darius is one of the kings of Persia. Now the, the, the land has been, or the, the kingdom has been transferred over uh, Darius came in, conquered the land. Um, he is now king. And we have the story of Daniel's, Daniel and the lions then. Likely Daniel at this point is in his 80s. He's old. Uh, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22. I want you to understand the response, right? Daniel, uh, Daniel again, uh, because of the, the tricks 
uh, that some of the other leaders, because Daniel had been risen in power in the kingdom and had great authority with a couple of other of the satraps, right? And they wanted to conspire against Daniel. They didn't like him. They didn't like the fact that he was, he was you know, the teacher's pet, the king's favorite. And so they, uh, yeah, all the teachers just laughed. And, and, uh, and so, you know, they, they conjured this thing and said, King, you know, it would be a good thing if you tell everybody that nobody can bow down to anybody but you for a certain period of time. Because they knew Daniel would bow down and pray every day, three times a day. So they did that. They reported back to the king that Daniel wasn't following the king's decree. The king is like, oh, no, I forgot about that. Not that he didn't know. He just wasn't paying attention. He fell to their prey, and he had no recourse because as the king of Persia, once the king had declared something so, it was the law of the land, and it couldn't be reversed. Uh, that is a Persian culture. And we come down to Daniel in the lion's den, right? So at that point, he has to throw him into Daniel in the lion's den. And he even says to Daniel when he throws him in, maybe your God can save you. And it tells us that they sealed the den. He went to bed. He never slept. He paced all night long. And first thing, crack of dawn, he goes because he's now fulfilled his decree that they would be thrown into the lion's den. They threw him in the lion's den. He's there all night. We get to chapter 6 and verse 22. Uh, 20, uh, verse 22, uh, my God, this is now, uh, it, when in, he calls down, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, in verse 20 through, through 21, uh, no, he gets there, King Darius, he, he, he calls down, he says, has your Lord saved you? Um, in verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, Daniel said, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. My God sent his angel. That's an interesting thought. Who is that angel? Is it an angel? Is it God? A theophany? Is it Jesus Christ? A Christophany? This is the second time we see an angelic or heavenly being in the book of Daniel saving and rescuing. Okay? Daniel chapter 7. Vision of the four beasts, right? Now we have the vision of the four beasts in here. And Daniel, once again, is called upon to interpret the dream. Um, these are the nations that will rise and fall. And at the end of these four nations, which, by the way, we have texts, ancient manuscripts from secular sources that represent the very facts that are in this particular chapter that verify that Daniel, number one, was written before all of these things came true. So for those that would say and claim that, yeah, they're just ancient manuscripts that were written after the fact to make it look like it was prophesied before it happened, all of these things transpired, but the book of Daniel, we have evidence, was written long before these things actually happened. All of these nations rose to power and then were conquered by the next conquering power. And we have all those four nations happening it, and then... Um, there's going to be a kingdom that will come that will rule forever by a king who is God himself. Interesting. Chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man. This is a name for Messiah. We see it in Revelation 19, verses 20 and 21 as well. We see one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days. So he's coming to the Ancient of Days, which is known as God himself. Um, so it's not God that we're talking about here, but the Son of Man, the Ancient. And he comes to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dimension, dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed god is god god rules the kingdom of men we saw that back in daniel chapter 4 now we see that there is one that is going to reign on the throne eternally he is the promised messiah the son of man who is now equated to with attributes of god himself daniel chapter 7 Verse 27 as well. In verse 27, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. 
That is God, Jehovah, the highest one. And his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Now, earlier in the chapter, it is the one who is coming, the Son of Man who is presented to the, to the Lord Most High. Now, it is the Lord Most High, the highest one. The Son of Man and the highest one are indeed God, both of them. Daniel chapter 9, over a page or two, depending upon your Bible. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Now, Daniel is getting towards the end of all of this back and forth, right, of nations coming after nations and dreams after dreams and all of the hardship as, as them being deported out of Israel. There's no indication, even though Ezra and Nehemiah went back, that Daniel ever left Babylon or the region of Babylon. He stayed in the land of the Chaldeans uh, for the remainder of his life. And at the end, he's getting weighed down with the sin of Israel itself, the sin of the Jews who rebelled continually against God. God gives him hope for the future. He says in verse 24, 70 weeks have I decreed for your people and your holy city. That's 70 sevens or 77 year periods, 490 years. To finish the transgression, that's the purpose of this punishment, right? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin. Daniel, you're weighed down with the sin of Israel, but listen, there's going to come a time that I will make an end of that sin. To make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Don't lose heart. To seal up vision and prophecy, that means to completely end it. Once a document that the king is following is completed, it gets sealed by the ring of the king and put in their archives. Sealed up vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's the beginning of Jeremiah, until Messiah the prince, there will be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. 72 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat in, uh, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. After 62 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off in the middle of that. Have nothing um, and have nothing and the people, uh, I'm sorry, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for a week. That's the week in between. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even unto a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolation. He's saying, Daniel, save heart. I'm going to put an end to iniquity. I'm going to bring in everlasting righteousness. There's going to be 70 weeks. But in the middle of those 70 weeks, a Messiah will come, the promised one, the anointed one. The word Messiah means anointed one. I'm going to bring him in. Wow, we're barely going to even get into this sermon today. <laughs> Giving you the background. It's okay. We'll be all right. I'm going to bring him in. Uh, God said, and everything is going to stop. And for a period of time, there's going to be a break in those 490 years. In that last week, uh, there's going to be a break. Jesus Christ will come. People will be cut off. There's going to be 483 years, according as we do the math with this, from the time that God promises to Nehemiah the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. That brings us, according to the Hebrew calendar, all the way up to the triumphal entry of Christ. 483 years. Jesus Christ comes. And then there's going to be a sealing up of things. There's going to be a change in things. There's going to be um, a, a pause in the middle of those times. So Messiah is promised. He's the one who's going to come um, in Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. He will be Messiah. The question is, is Jesus the Messiah? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. How do we connect that to Jesus Christ? 
to the word. Well, we're going to get there. All right. Um, In the beginning was the word. So let's turn all the way back to the Gospel of John. If you're not there already, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, Number one, the word is not an inanimate object. We already know that it's given a masculine pronoun. It's a person. We already know that it's not simply the Bible itself. Because it's not an object, it's a person. I'm not going to get into the pronoun identification things right now, but it was a he. And it is in the Greek, in the original. All right? In the beginning. For those of you that are concerned that certain religions today, like Jehovah's Witnesses, might take or remove out of that verse the definite article, right? In in the English, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was the God. There is no definite article there, but it's also not needed. In fact, it's not warranted, because if we put the definite article in the original Hebrew, then he would be the only God, and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit would not be God. But in the context of this, it's the context of this that determines whether or not the word that is going to come is actually not only Jesus, but God in the flesh. The one promised in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So we come to this passage. Um, All things came into uh, through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Why am I taking you to all these places? I want to take you to one more place, and then we'll just do the sermon next week, okay? So bear with me on this. I want you to understand that this is claiming that whoever this person is, the Word. He was present in the beginning. It was for him that all things were created. And by him were all things created. So who is that? We go back to the beginning. And in the beginning of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then we have six days of creation in which God formed the firmament, the foundation of the earth, that Paul talks about later as God determining our lives before the foundation of the world, right? So he builds that foundation. We are told that the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is there. So we know it's not talking about the Holy Spirit because it's not referencing the Holy Spirit here. Who else could it be? That's God. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Jesus Christ in verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, speaking of Christ, Christ was mentioned already earlier in the first chapter, uh, in the first 12 verses. He is the image of the invisible Son, the firstborn of all creation, for by him, here's the same wording, all things were created, speaking of Jesus Christ, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, not just the physical things, but even invisible concepts, invisible things, whether to our eyes or truly um, the the thought world, the the world of physics, the, the, the spiritual realm, both the visible things and the invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. People try and put all kinds of different definitions to what those things are, and that's, that's okay. I, it's, those things are not the point. The point is that all concepts, 
all rulers, all powers, everyone that exists that leads people or leads this world in fulfilling God's created purpose, and that is to dress and keep, right? God's creation. All of them he created. Rulers, dominions, authorities, all things, and the verse 16 have been created through him and for him. Same wording as John 1, 1. By the way, Colossians was written before the Gospel of John. Did John pull some of this from Colossians? Maybe. He is before all things. That before doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean in position. It means in authority. He is over all. And we see that in just a minute. And in him all things hold together. All things, verse 17, consists because Christ holds them together. That's how he is before or over all things. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the first one to be resurrected from the dead. Other had been raised from the dead to die again. Jesus Christ and the apostles raised some from the dead. Lazarus was one example, but we don't have him here today with us. He died again. Jesus Christ did not. He was the firstborn from the dead. Uh, and end of uh, verse 18, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's position. He is first in position from the grave. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now, all God's fullness dwells in Christ. He is God. We can struggle with the idea that God became a man and how could man have been, a full nature of man have been added to Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that he was, in fact, God. And he was, in fact, creator in the beginning with God, sustainer of continuing creation to exist. And it's there for his glory. In him, all the fullness of God to dwell. And through him, verse 20, to reconcile all things to himself. Not just people. Christ shed his blood to redeem all of creation back from the curse of sin. It's not just about me and you. It's about all of God's creation. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Wow. Jesus Christ is the creator. The very same wording that is used in direct reference to Jesus Christ in the beginning of the book of Colossians is the very same wording that is used at the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was this person with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. There is nothing made that was not made by him, for him, or continues to be about his sustaining work. Jesus Christ was God that creator, and the Word was God that creator. When we get to the book of Revelation, we see Jesus Christ referenced very directly as the Word. And there are other places as well that we see, um, and this is our first point. I finally got to the first point after a half an hour. The first point? The Word was God, God in the flesh. And we know He's God, right? Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and His name, speaking of Messiah, who Jesus Christ claimed to be, I didn't even trace all those verses where Jesus Christ claimed to be the Messiah directly to the Pharisees, and they were so convinced that that was what He was claiming, they sought to stone Him to death for blasphemy. How dare you call yourself God? I and the Father are one one of the shorter verses in all the New Testament. And the Pharisees are like, <gasps> stone him. How can he say he's God? Well, here's how. And he was Messiah. In other places, he claimed to be the Messiah. And they, they strove to do the same thing. He is Messiah, the one promised to Daniel in the Old Testament. He is Jesus Christ, the Word, as talked about here in John chapter 1. He is Christ, the Creator, as Paul talked about in Colossians chapter 1. We don't need the definite article in John 1 to know that the Word is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. 
And Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, talks to us about the names of the Messiah, that his name will be called. We just came through this season, right? Wonderful. That is beyond comprehension. Only God is beyond the confines of of creative understanding. He is wonderful counselor. That means it is according to his counsel that all things happen. It is a label of sovereignty. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God. Messiah will be mighty God. Wow. That's a hard one for certain religions today to swallow. That was a hard one for the Jews of the day to swallow. And understand, what do you, what do you mean you're Messiah? And then to go beyond that and say, not only are you claiming to be Messiah, but you're claiming to be God. They really didn't have a concept that Messiah would be a God, but rather be a human king. They didn't understand. But it's all there. We see it in Scripture. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. The next label, I love this one. Everlasting Father. A a label that is only rightfully given to God in a relationship form. He's not just like the Greeks and the Romans had, a God that's up there, that's impersonal, whatever his name is, Zeus or all the other gods that they had, they were impersonal gods. They didn't have relationship with people. They just had people as slaves so that they might, the slaves might work for them enough to appease them, to maybe give them some blessings in their lives so that they would continue to go on and honor them in their lives. That was all the relationship there was in those man-made gods. But God always was meant to be a personal God from the very beginning of creation when he walked in the cool of the garden in harmony and fellowship with Adam and Eve to the God who sat down with Abraham and chose him out to Moses who he first saw in a burning bush but protected him from infancy on. He's a personal God. And Jesus Christ, the names of the Messiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. And now to tie it to the book of Daniel, Prince of Peace. He's the God who brings peace. Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that was come into being. In him, we'll look at this next week, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined into the darkness. And the darkness couldn't comprehend it. Have you ever been in a dark room and just lit a little match? A room that it has completely no light in it takes very little light to illuminate everything in the room for you. Darkness from sin could not comprehend, hold back, keep corralled the light of Jesus Christ when he entered into this world. Remember the shepherds? out on the hill. They were the first ones to receive the angelic pronouncement. In Bethlehem, there's a baby born. To, unto you this day, in the city of David, is a Savior, Christ the Lord. And suddenly, there was with a shout, the hosts of heaven, all of heaven opened up to these poor, little, innocent shepherds. They were the low lives. They were the lowest. They were the... They were the helpers of the blue-collar workers, right? They weren't even apprentices at the time. They were the ones pushing the brooms. And God revealed to them a glimpse into glory to see the hosts of heaven as, as heaven opens up. The Son of God, the glory of God. Jesus Christ came into this world, and the darkness on that hillside could not hold back the light of God as he peeled back the curtains of creative existence so that they could glimpse into his eternal glory. And then he was sent, veiled in human flesh, the full nature of humanity added to his deity, to his God nature. 
and was sent then in human flesh as the light of the world. The very same light on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus Christ pulled back the veil of his flesh to show to Peter, James, and John a glimpse of his rightful glory before he was sent to the cross. Wow. He's the light of the world. John was writing as a first-hand witness of Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Now we're going to come to the communion table. You know, everything about the Christian life, about these books, about the quest process, it's all about now that I believe Jesus Christ was God and he died on the cross for me and he shed his blood and he sacrificed his flesh for me. Now that I put my faith and trust in that and I see the need to join a group of people, to to be unified with them in, in membership as well, to become part of the church, now what do I do? Where do I go? How do I serve? How do I be connected? That's what that process is all about. And the table, there's no power in the table any more than there was power in the baptism to save you. It didn't cleanse. It doesn't cleanse. All it does is once you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, baptism in the book of Acts tells us that it's there to cleanse our conscience. It's in the sense that now I am telling everyone I am surrendered to God and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Not to forgive me of my sins. That's already been done by faith as I accept God and Jesus Christ as my Savior and believe that he's going to save me from my sin. So if you've done that, the Apostle Paul, I'm going to ask the guys to come forward as I, as I talk a little bit more here. The Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul shares with the church of Corinth who have lost sight. You see, although these books that are over here, these books are all about how we exercise our relationship with the Lord. From coming into relationship with the Lord, to sharing about our relationship with the Lord, to serving within the church of Jesus Christ, and then beyond that, how to become a member should we choose to go that direction. In all of those things, the central part of that is the Word of God and the person of Jesus Christ. And we don't want to lose focus of that like the church of Corinth did. They were all about how do we make the church big? How do we market this really good? How do we make this appeal to the masses of people so that we can build a big congregation that's wealthy? And they did. They built one of the first mega churches, one of the first mega Christian churches in Corinth. And it was a worldly church. They allowed sin to come in. They didn't confront anybody with sin. They were starting to allow false doctrines to come in. They had people come in like women that were, out, that were supposedly saved out of temple prostitution, shaving their heads as a wrong image to say that they were the ones that were in charge like the men instead of the women. All this was cultural stuff that 1 Corinthians deals with. The Apostle Paul writes them and says, look, you've lost sight. You've gotten to the point where you have a meal, you have the Lord's table, that you all get together and you push your way in front of other people because you feel that you're more important and you have more right to the food than somebody else. You're not focusing on Jesus Christ at all. You're filling your belly. There's some things that are wrong with your church. And so he said, be careful that you come to this table in a worthy fashion there in 1 Corinthians 11. It means, number one, that you're saved, that you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This table doesn't save you. This is not the body of Christ, nor does it become such. And that is not the blood of Christ, nor does it become such. It's crackers and juice. It's the bread and the cup. What's important is not what they physically are or what they physically become. What's important is, where is my heart when I come to partake of it? Have I given myself to to God? Am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Which means, right, the great, the great Commission, go you into all the world and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Am I striving now to follow all Christ's teachings? Then this 
is a moment together with the church that we're commanded to get together and to commemorate what Christ has done in our lives. I am not dead anymore. I'm alive in Christ. I don't have to live after the world. I don't have to live after the things of the world, 1 John. I don't have to to walk in the spirit of the flesh, Galatians 5. I can walk after the spirit. And I now want to celebrate what Christ has done in my life together with his church to proclaim, like with baptism, I'm a follower of Christ. So the Apostle Paul there in 1 Corinthians 11 says, don't come unworthy. Number one, be saved. Number two, make sure that that you're working on cleaning things out of your life that you know God would, would not have you do because Jesus Christ taught against it. And be a true and increasing, set-apart follower of Jesus Christ. If we come to the table with that hard attitude, then we celebrate together the table. If we come in an unworthy fashion, then we are guilty of the body and the blood, it says there in 1 Corinthians 11. It doesn't mean that now I'm going to be judged for my sin as a Christian. It just means that I'm doing the very things that forced Christ to have to die on the cross in the first place because I'm rebelling against God. Listen, we might have all kinds of questions about what ifs in our lives. If we come here and we know that there's something we're holding back that we know does not honor God, trust God to take care of the details. You just follow him. Change whatever it is. Whatever's in your life that's standing in the way so that you can take at the table in a worthy fashion. Whatever's holding you back. And all the fears about, well, what will happen? What do I do if this? And I might lose contact with this person or that person. Or I might be ostracized from my job or or from something else. I I, I might be alone. Well, listen, you're here with the church and you're not alone. And you're in Jesus Christ. You're not alone. And you won't be alone for long. Do what God stirs your heart to do, to follow him. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 then, um, verse 28, but a man must examine himself. Um, That just means to test, to see if it's real. Stop for a moment and test to see if your following of Jesus is true. Is it real? If it's not, surrender your life now while we pray. If it is real, then ask yourself about where your life is. So let a man examine himself, um, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So stop, take stock. Where are you spiritually? What in your life might you be holding back? And then at this point, spend a little bit of time of quiet prayer between you and God. Just surrender whatever you have to the Lord. Ask him to help you know how to do that, right? James chapter 1 tells us that. If you lack any wisdom in how to do this, ask of God who won't hold back. He'll share liberally with you, and he won't belittle you for asking. Ask God now for help to overcome whatever stands in your way of being a full-hearted, surrendered follower of Jesus. Take a couple of moments in quiet prayer before we move on. I'd like to ask Dave Morad if he'd please give thanks for the bread. Our dear Lord, we thank you for the communion that helps us as we remember what Christ has done for us, the sacrifice of his body. And we Thank and praise you for the love that you have for us to do such a thing to save us from our sins. We pray that you will give us the faith and the strength to live in a manner to allow Christ to live through us and others see Christ in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
So in the Gospels, we have related to us the Lord's Supper and what he did there at the Lord's Supper, where he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this body is broken for you. Here in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul now is giving instruction to the church. They've already forgotten to commemorate the death of Christ because they weren't living according to the salvation that God had given them. And so there he said, for I received from the Lord, in verse 23 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. This is what I already told you. Corinth, you're not doing it. That the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, when the very night that Judas would go out and betray him for 30 pieces of silver and later regret his decision, throw the silver back at the Pharisee's feet and go out and hang himself for what he had done. That very same night, the one who he had empowered and sent out with the apostles, with the 70, to perform miracles. The one who was in charge of all the money, yet continually embezzled from the, from the, the treasury of the apostles. The one who traveled with him and he washed the very feet of and served all of those three years. Went out and betrayed him. On the very same night, he took the bread And when he had given thanks, he thanked God for his body that was about to be broken for me and you. What a beautiful thing. He had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ask Joe Coco if he'd give thanks for the cup. Father God, I want to thank you for saving me, for shedding your blood for me. Your word says without the the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Sadly, you had to come down and do it for us. So Lord, as we search our hearts today, as we look into our future, Lord, allow us to be, allow us to better follow you because you loved us first. Verse 25 of chapter 11, he gives them further instructions. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We've talked about that before. That new covenant was the covenant that was promised to the nation of Israel. It was paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ for Israel. The new covenant in the Old Testament is very expressly for the nation of Israel, not for the church, but we receive, we are recipients of blessing from that. Just like in other places of the Bible, it says even that the word of God came through Israel's disobedience. That the church itself came through Israel's rejection of Christ and came to the Gentiles, and so here we are. All of those things are true. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's different. It is 
omnidirectional. It is not based on anything you do. It is solely based on my promise and my securing it. It's a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, again, in remembrance of me. How do we do it? It says, therefore, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim what Christ has done until he returns. And that's why we do this together. Well, there at the Lord's Supper, uh, it says that the apostles, the disciples with Jesus Christ, sang a song and they went home rejoicing. So at the end, we always end with songs. Join us as we sing. Please stand with us for that. Blessed be the ties that bind. Here we go. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in art and hope to meet again. I hope you understand that the Jesus in whom you've trusted for salvation is the promised Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Word of God. And that is what the Gospel of John is all about. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a light in darkness. Thank you for giving us the joy of walking in the light. And Lord, in turn, as you have saved us and redeemed us, being ones who can walk in the light and show forth our light as on a dark path. Lord, help us to live in the way that we proclaim we believe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.